Tales from the Loop is Amazon's gorgeous limited series adapted from artist Simon Stalinhart's austere retro futuristic illustrations of the same name. I'm Rob Lacuria, senior editor at Gold Derby. I'm here with composer Paul Leonard Morgan. Paul, you collaborated with the legendary Philip Glass on his, on this, what I think is almost a masterpiece. Um, talk us through how that worked in bringing the score to life with him. Yeah, no pressure there. It's like, what I think <laughs> is a masterpiece? Wow. <laughs> um, collaborating with Philip is just, it's like a bucket list tick. Yeah, and when, when they spoke at the beginning about it, they were just kind of saying, well, you know, we think that you would be a perfect match with Philip. Um, so to go over and meet him. So I flew over to New York, went and had a chat with him, and nothing was shot at that stage. So it was literally Mark, wonderful director, and Nathaniel, the showrunner, had sent us a load of pictures from Simon Stalin Hack's artwork. And we just literally kind of sat there talking about how we thought the style might be and stuff. But it's really hard when you don't actually look, as a film composer, obviously I look at images the whole time and try and get inspired. So we literally just sat there looking at Simon's book, plonked on the piano, and we just started writing some stuff and kind of had no idea how it would go. I was saying to Philip, well, are you writing melodies and I'm taking them, or are we both writing, or how's it working? And it was just this really organic process at the end. He started writing these triplets and the beautiful chords, and then I started singing very bad voice. <laughs> this would be the cello line over the top. And, and that was great. It was a kind of first meeting at his house in New York, just literally kind of chatting through it writing some stuff at the piano and then he went off and wrote a load of stuff i went off and wrote a load of stuff about two weeks later in my inbox it's like oh philip glass <laughs> so, um but literally you know, then we started just collaborating like that i heard some of his stuff it's like, that'd be really nice if we had this over the top he heard some of mine and it takes a while i've never collaborated with a composer before so it takes a while to actually get to it sounds ridiculous but to trust each other and to try and get in each other's wavelength as far as what instrumentation are we talking about when he says oboe does he mean oboe combined with strings or is it literally just a solo oboe just stupid kind of shorthand things that as, as a composer you talk yeah. about wow um i always wonder with collaborations whether there's parts of the score that one guy does and parts of the score the other guy does or is it all like really enmeshed and mixed into one what was this particular score like in terms of how you both contributed yeah i mean literally it was even stevens he would send this stuff over as i say and then i'd look at it some bit works some bit doesn't and again because nothing had been shot it was just a collaboration so early on trying to establish the style of it you know, normally on a pilot you get about two three weeks this we had about two three months to, just to come up with this beautiful collaboration with mark and mark would then come back and say i love that i need something really basic for the sound of the loop for example um yeah. for, those that haven't, for those that haven't seen it it's kind of weird stuff that goes on around this town but it's sci-fi but not really sci-fi because it's more about the interconnecting stories of human contact i would say than the actual relying on the technology yeah. so um, you know i know i was just thinking like because uh, there are there are moments that to me sound a lot like the philip glass score but there's a lot of really interesting new stuff in this it's really contemplative it's um it's beautifully melancholic um there's a love there's a lot of beautiful piano work in this there's some string work what was um your i guess highlight theme or cue that you were really proud of when uh, when all is said and done and you look back at this score there's a few of them i mean walk to school is the main theme yeah. as it were for the loop and that was one of the first ones that we came up with um i so beautiful cause i came up with the cello melody over the top and it was just i don't know it established it and it was actually then when mark started shooting it and we saw this we started scoring it to that it changed completely in the edit but it still stood the test of time as this is the main theme this is going to work great and then taking those chords and the triplets the triplets carried their way through but as far as one that i'm really proud of there's a track called blink of an eye which yeah. comes at the end of episode four andrew stanton's episode and andrew stanton yeah, directed wally one of my favorite films and he's just there's something about the fact that he's a pixar director and then comes and shoots this glorious film I don't know, all of episode four, I just well up in tears. I, I don't cry at TV. This is not. <laughs> so there was something about it where, I don't know, it was just so close to home. And then that theme, we then took and put at the end of the entire series, episode eight, and put a solo cello over the top. And I remember recording at Capitol Studios. And when we recorded that solo cello, it was the culmination of eight, nine months of work. And I don't know, we were just in that control room listening to it and everyone was just so silent at the end of it just going wow you know and it's not often to say that happens with your music normally it's 
great that's another key that's another key with this yeah. like, wow we've really achieved something hopefully with this with this score and just quickly on that front when we spoke about it at the beginning it was always supposed to be a standalone score bit. what is film music film music is music that works with film but yeah. a lot of the time it's underscore or it's soundscape and that's not bad it's just because it's what the film's crying out for with this nathaniel and mark and said right from the start we want the score so good that people are just going to listen to it by itself with beautiful melodies with beautiful this and they amazon released it did a visualizer kind of thing on youtube within a week it had a million and a half, i think it was a million and a half hits or something like that it was it was bonkers and everyone's just sending emails from milan going our whole town being devastated by coronavirus but we're listening to this music and it's really helping us get through it and genuinely that is such a moving thing as a composer you know, a composer said say that to me a lot. Um, uh, one of the outcomes you'd like to hear is that people listen to the score outside of the experience of watching the TV show or the film. I know this score does that, as you mentioned, it's on YouTube. I've, I've done that YouTube one hour clip uh, where I've just had it on in the background while I'm doing stuff and I listen to it in the car. Do, do you, does that make you happy when people are experiencing your work orally without ever having to watch what they're what 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 you were scoring originally which was actually the 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 visual element yeah i mean someone said someone said to me what so wait so you wrote all of this without seeing any of the film i said no 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 no. (laughs) we went away and wrote stuff for a couple of months and then it was all scored to picture but the fact that so many people have just heard this music, I mean, it was playlisted on Spotify and Apple Music and so on. The fact that so many people have heard this music without even being aware of the series and then said, oh my goodness, this comes from a series. I'm going to go and watch the series. And Mark keeps on text to me just going, do you know what? I'm getting a bit sick of this. Everybody keeps commenting on the music. He just comments on me. <laughs> 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 obviously in a jocular way. But no, it, it, it means the absolute world, particularly with everything that's going on at the moment. People just yeah. keep saying, this is such a moment of serenity in an otherwise crazy world. And it's normally, that just sounds unbelievably cheesy, but I know for whatever reason, it, it, it's got zeitgeist. It really means a lot. Yeah. And I love it how um, you mentioned, and I knew about this already, that you scored it as the series was being made. So rather than in post-production where scores are normally made, um, this show is one of its highlights is its visual aesthetic. It's beautifully it's so striking so obviously that would have given you an abundance of things to work with right and were you inspired by what you were seeing on the screen yeah i mean when i start scoring a project and again phillips will be very different but for me i just like immersing myself in the world so if i'm working on cyberpunk they'll send me lots of pictures around the place of the game if i'm working on some minion short films they'll send me loads of minions and then the film the studio just looks like universal studios you know but it really helped get your mind into this world and so obviously if nothing's shot you're kind of like well it's all fine and well sending me a script but my i'm rubbish at reading scripts so it's, i need some sort of visual so as i say so they sent me simon's wonderful um, visuals and they sent it to philip so when we were looking at these visuals to begin with i mean it's incredible artwork i've never heard of a film that's based on artwork i've heard of it based on yeah. a book but not on artwork so it's kind of weird but um yeah so we're looking at this and for example to, to, to give an example of the pitfalls that that's developing we went off and wrote a theme for the robot because there was a robot in it and yeah. mark came back and said i mean it's a lovely theme but why is it so dark and we're like because it's a big F-off robot <laughs> yeah but it just is and of course if you're not aware of what's actually going on he said well, yes there's a robot but it's not scary it just lives hand in hand as does technology in this town with with the world it doesn't need to be scary it's just a girl walking next to a robot right? you could have said this two months ago right back <laughs> um, yeah. but again you know I, get, I go back to it when you get art and a genuinely i mean the cinematography in this series is like nothing yeah. they're like eight individual standalone films they're eight individual cinematographers but Jeff Cronenworth on episode one, yeah, it, it's just stunning. And I said that to Mark, you've created something so iconic because some of these visuals look like they belong in Simon's books, but don't, you know, so they've created this world. Yeah. But we had a load of people doing covers of the soundtrack, which has been a lovely thing. We've had, like, I don't know, over a thousand. And they just send it people on guitar. There was an accordion player doing one, which sounded very Tim Burton and Danny Elfman. But it was really cool. But the point of this is, suddenly dancers have started covering it. So. Let's look at this as an art world. You've got dancers in lockdown. They had over a half million hits on Instagram, right? I'm rubbish at Instagram, and they just sent me this link saying, please send this on to Philip as well. 
and three minutes and off they went and it was beautiful right so they covered and they did a dance based on a cover which was based on our music which was based on a film which was based on simon's beautiful artwork so it just comes full circle it's, it's bonkers it doesn't happen in this world <laughs> it really doesn't it's such a great example of how music and this show in particular um, actually made people feel something. And I'm leading to this question. Um, there's parts of the score, to me, are really meditative and melancholic and dark. Like there's some long, deep string work that made me feel really unnerved, unnerved and unsettled and wrung out almost. Like it's hard to explain, but I'm wondering, a lot of that is because of strings. Why do you think strings because I'm a sucker for strings. Why are they so effective for provoking emotions so viscerally? That's a good question. I mean, episode one, we had a massive orchestra on. Um, Fox, thank you so much. They just said, whatever you want, you're you 100%. And genuinely, we said, well, we can't achieve this sound. And Arnie, the wonderful um, host. So yeah, they all gave us what we needed. And episode one, we had this massive orchestra, as I say. And then we realized that in actual fact, it doesn't need to be a massive orchestra. It did for that specific film but say they're almost like eight individual standalone films that work together nathaniel would kill me for saying that he would say they yeah. need to be working together but so got to episode two well, let's try this with a quartet and you're you, know, you were saying that episode two you felt particularly emotional about and yeah. two was the first one we used quartet was like, wow there's something really intimate with this and by episode three i think we'd really found that sound that we got a quartet we got a harp and we got a flute and we got piano and that was pretty much it there was something about it's like playing a gig i always say that if you play a gig in front of eighty thousand people it's great but you don't necessarily get this massive adrenaline buzz but if you play a gig in front of 50 people in a small club it feels like the audience are right on stage with you and it's the yeah. same thing I, I sometimes feel with a load of players it's like you stand in front of a big orchestra and that's great and there's a big buzz, but it's not as close and personal as it is when you actually just have a few players. And the cello, Nathaniel said that as well, he said the cello just became our secret weapon. <laughs> and I think yeah. it gets to episode eight, where there's a six minute sequence, and we tried to take the Swedish song, Nathaniel last asked we could take the Swedish song in episode one, and there's a montage in episode eight without giving it away of yeah. what's happened almost. Um, and tried the Swedish song, and I said, look, you can have this, but look, Here's our main theme, and this is how it might work. And he loved it. It's, oh, this is perfect. Forget about the Swedish song. When you get to episode eight, do your thing. So it was six minutes of just piano and cello. And it was great. But the problem was they cut it to the original demo that Philip and I had done. And it wasn't a clip track or anything. It was just Philip had played some, some. he had sent it over. I'd gone and played some. We got the, cello, the demo cello, cello over the top. So how the hell do you place that when it's not done to click for six minutes? It's all over, and they've cut it specifically to it. So I'm just there kind of going, do, 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 oh, oh, rats, do, 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 oh. Oh, yeah. It's really tricky, but going back to your question about strings, I mean, for me, the more emotional stuff is the individual cello rather than we got some double basses in episode seven for the slightly darker horror stuff when they're off on the island. And it yeah. definitely adds to it. But it almost makes it dark and thrillery. Whereas there's something about just the beautiful resonance and the harmonics of strings as a quartet, which I don't know, just just really shine through. Yeah, it really really works for this particular piece. Um, and I the other to sorry, 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 I was going to say just on that front on episode yeah. four. I said to them, yeah, normally you've got to do mock-ups and all your gear and kind of make it sound like orchestras so that people can imagine it. And I said, look, I can't do a mock-up of this because the sound that's in my head is a very raw violin that's kind of folky I'm from Scotland it's a very kind of folky Scottish sound but played on harmonics and Margaret if I know how to achieve that <laughs> so they were like well what so we just got to trust you and so like, yeah pretty much and again you know it doesn't happen that much where you have that kind of trust between the creative team and the producers and so on and we just went off to the studio and we had one of the, viol the violin from the quartet violin one she came in and I just said, well, look, can we try it like this? Try it with a harmonic, try it like this, try it raw, try it with different. And in the end, it was so beautiful. It's like, right, that's it. That's going to be for episode five. That's going to be for episode six. We've got that kind of sound for, if that was for Echo Sphere. And yeah. it's so wonderful when the sound of musicians, specific musicians, suddenly become integral to the sound of your score. Again, it's about that human connectivity. 
Yeah, um, that's right. And like when I first uh, embarked on watching the show, I knew it was a retro futuristic and people use that word a lot when talking about this. It's very hard to explain without using that word. And I was thinking, okay, well, the score is probably going to be quite retro futuristic as well and nostalgic and there'll be some electronic elements. But you completely um, subverted that expectation because it's more classic, empathetic, meditative and as i said earlier melancholic was there a, was there any suggestion that you would go in that kind of futuristic side or were you quite happy to keep it in this place where it was more um, yeah and going back to your original question a while back about how we collaborated i did a school called dread a while back which is yeah. apocalyptic <laughs> <laughs> but in a very, very different style. And again, you know, if you took it down that world, it's going to be quite Stranger Things. Um, and that's absolutely great and wonderful. But I mean, Nathaniel had said to, I think, the execs right from the start and to you know, Fox that, and Amazon, this was not a Stranger Things show, you know, which it could so easily be a bit sci-fi. So when we spoke to begin with, Mark was very clear uh, that he said, look, I, I just want this analogue. <laughs> when he said analog, I thought he meant analog synth. So I'm talking to Philip going, so I think they're going to have some weird sounds going in here as a hybrid. And then I finally work out that Mark actually means analog. He just means no digital sounds whatsoever. Um, so once we got that out of the way, Philip and I were pretty clear. It's just like, look, you know, the sound of the loop, for example, we spoke about what is the most basic primal sound that you could have, because this loop could be you know, technological or it could be something from millions of years ago. It's like, well, the sound of a recorder. Philip has said an Egyptian nay, this Middle Eastern wind instrument. I said, well, we could do the recorder. That's a very basic sound. And from there, you know, we start, I started playing some recorders on it. And then we're like, okay, well, lie the phone. And a lie the phone, don't be, you know, it's like this basically just a bunch of stones, which so it looks like a vibraphone, but has yeah. kind of stones on top instead that you hit. So I was like, well, that's fundamentally the most basic primal thing you can do as a caveman, hit stones. So I just went into the garden, got a load of stones, stuck some tubes below it, because the house and the studio have just been finished recently. So I had a load of kind of dream pipes around, put those below the actual stones, different sized stones, and started hitting them, sampled them up, made a contact instrument out of it, and then we used that as a microphone. So although it is digital, you know, it doesn't sound like it, it's analog. So every time you hear the loop, you've got those weird sounds that yeah. could be Futuristic, but really aren't. It's not really electronic, but most of it is just this very analog score. You've got me going on to deep into the sounds, but it's, there's something about this combination of sounds where mm. if you score without electronica and you're used to doing hybrids, which is where I use real instruments and also electronica, whereas Philip would tend to be more of the, the classical genre. Yeah. And going into this, writing with one hand tied behind your back, it's like, okay, I don't have any of those. How are we going to achieve this sound? And you, it becomes very easy to rely on all of these layers of samples and sounds to create your very electronic world, even if it's trying to sound like an orchestra or build it up and pump up the orchestra. So when you suddenly strip things out, which is one of the things that Philip did genius at, so look, mm. you don't need all these sounds. We've got piano, sounds beautiful on the piano. You just hum this tune, sounds beautiful. Okay, you want to put that on the cello? We'll do that. It's working like it is. Do we need anything else? No, but we'll get the quartet as well. So it, when you suddenly strip it down, instead of just producing as you go along, I think it's yeah. very easy to get used to all your equipment to produce stuff. Whereas if you start concentrating on the fundamentals of composition, which is melody and chords, it suddenly really takes it right back to basics. And I think, I hope, that's one of the reasons why this score works as a standalone, because it's all about the composition rather than necessarily the production techniques over it. Yeah. Um, quick final question is, you, you're predominantly a film composer when looking at your work for um, visual media. Why did you do, decide that TV was something that you wanted to try? Because I would imagine there's a lot more quantitatively that you have to score for TV as opposed to one film. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> My first ever concerto at the moment. And you know, that's it was like this breath of fresh air. I said, Well, do, do I send them demos? Like, no, you never send demos on classical music, you just send them the music again. That thing of trust, film, you have so much time to experiment a, a lot of the time. I mean, I did a film Limitless, and I think the whole thing was up yeah. to an hole, but normally you have a lot more time to actually experiment. But so I'm looking over there because I've got a poster there, so you can't see yeah. it. But we have a lot of time to experiment with sounds and TV, particularly on like 20 episode shows, 
it's over and over and over. You've got like five days to score the episode. And whilst I guess there's something quite refreshing about that because you've got a deadline, off it goes, it's on air that night. Um, There's also something quite hard about trying to create 50, 60 minutes of brand new content every week and making it sound as good as anything else that you're proud of rather than just going, oh, that'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, but but it's true, you know, because it's always like, well, the first, first thing is to get 50 minutes of music done. Then you can go back and concentrate on the quality. It's like, no, you just got to produce it all up at the same time. So I think with this, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's the wonderful three months collaboration before they'd even shot it. It might have been two, I can't remember, but it was something, it was a long time anyway, which meant that we had a load of material. We'd written a couple of quartet tracks for playback for them as well, because they were filming a quartet yeah. for it. But it was just, you don't get a chance to do that. And I think that's why I was so desperately sad in December last year when we'd finished, but it was the final um, mix. I just said, it felt like this really small, close-knit family. George, the music supervisor, Mark Nathaniel, Arnie and Poe, as I say, it was just, I don't know, it's, it doesn't happen that much because normally everything's so hell for leather. Whereas this, they're just like, you need another week? You got it. You know, we want this to wow. be the best it possibly can. And I think that one of the weirdest things was I, I only watched one episode on Amazon so far because I've been busy, but I watched this episode and I suddenly saw it with all of the effects. <laughs> so episode eight, there's a robot fight. That's all I will say. But yeah. when when I was scoring that particular part, all I had was text on screen going robot, robot, and it was going like this. I was like, "Well, are they moving? Are they headbutting? Are they what are they doing?" And so it became very apparent very quickly that I wasn't going to do this as a traditional film score. Yeah, yeah. That particular part because you're not going to be able to get hit points when the text rubs against each other. So it was very much a kind of wash and rising up and down on the levels. And then when you finally saw it, it's like, all right, that works. Just not quite what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we loved it. And we congratulate you on a really interesting score for Tales from the Loop. And thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, man. Love you to chat. Now, everybody go to Gold Derby, make your predictions, click subscribe. We've got lots of contender chats just like this one with Paul.